The Treasure of Lemon Brown by Walter Dean Myers The dark sky filled with angry swirling clouds reflected Greg Ridley's mood as he sat on the stoop of his building. His father's voice came to him again, first reading the letter the principal had sent to the house, then lecturing endlessly about his poor efforts in math. I had to leave school when I was 13, his father had said. That's a year younger than you are now. If I'd had half the chances you have, I'd... Greg sat in the small, pale green kitchen listening, knowing the lecture would end with his father saying he couldn't play ball with the scorpions. He had asked his father the week before, and his father had said it depends on his next report card. It wasn't often the scorpions took on new players, especially 14-year-olds, and this was a chance of a lifetime for Greg. He hadn't been allowed to play high school ball, which he had really wanted to do, but playing for the community center team was the next best thing. Report cards were due in a week, and Greg had been hoping for the best. But the principal had ended the suspense early when she sent the letter saying Greg would probably fail math if he didn't spend more time studying. And you want to play basketball? His father's brows knitted over deep brown eyes. That must be some kind of joke. Now you just get into your room and hit those books. That had been two nights before. His father's words, like the distant thunder that had now echoed through the streets of Harlem, still rumble, rumbled softly in his ears. It was beginning to cool. Gusts of winds made bit, bits of paper dance between the parked cars. There was a flash of nearby lightning, and soon large drops of rain splashed onto his jeans. He stood to go upstairs, thought of the lecture that probably awaited him if he did anything except shut himself in his room with his math book, and started walking down the street instead. Down the block there was an old tenement that had been abandoned for some months. Some of the guys had held an impromptu checker tournament there the week before, and Greg had noticed that the door, once boarded over, had been slightly ajar. Pulling his collar up as high as he could, he checked for traffic and made a dash across the street. He reached the house just as another flash of lightning changed the day, changed the night to day for an instant, then returned the graffiti-scarred building to the grim shadows. He vaulted over the outer stairs and pushed tentatively on the door. It was open, and he let himself in. The inside of the building was dark except for the dim light that filtered through the dirty windows from the street lamps. There was a room a few feet from the door, and from where he stood in the entrance, Greg could see a squarish patch of light on the floor. He entered the room, frowning at the musty smell. It was a large room that might have been someone's parlor at one time. Squinting, Greg could see the old table on its side against one wall. It would look like a pile of rags or a torn mattress in the corner, and a couch with one side broken in front of the window. He went to the couch. The side that wasn't broken was comfortable enough, though a little creaky. From the spot he could see the blinking neon sign over the bodega on the corner. He sat a while, watching the sign blink first green, then red, allowing his mind to drift to the scorpions, then to his father. His father had been a poster worker for all of Greg's life, and was proud of it, often telling Greg how hard he had worked to pass a test. Greg had heard the story too many times to be interested now. For a moment, Greg thought he heard something that sounded like a scraping against the wall. He listened carefully, but it was gone. Outside, the wind had picked up, sending the rain against the window with a force that shook the glass in its frame. A car passed, its tires hissing over the wet street and its red taillights glowing in the darkness. Greg thought he heard the noise again, his stomach tightening as he held himself still and listened intently. There wasn't any more scraping noises, but he was sure he heard something in the darkness something breathing. He tried to figure out just where the breathing was coming from. He knew it was in the room within him. Slowly he stood, tensing. As he turned, a flash of lightning lit up the room, frightening him with its sudden brilliance. He saw nothing, just the overturned table, a pile of rags, and an old newspaper on the floor. Could he have been imagining the sounds? He continued listening, but heard nothing, and thought that it might have just been rats. Still, he thought, as soon as the rain let up, he would leave. He went to the window and was about to look out when he heard a voice behind him. Don't try nothing because I got a razor sharp enough to cut a week into nine days. Greg, except for an involuntary tremor in his knees, stood stock still. The voice was high and brittle, like dry twigs being broken, surely not one he had ever heard before. There was a shuffling sound as the person who had been speaking moved a step closer. Greg turned, holding his breath, his eyes straining to see in the dark room. The upper part of the figure before him was still in darkness. The lower half was in the dim rectangle of light that fell unevenly from the window. There were two feet in cracked, dirty shoes from which rose legs 
that were wrapped in rags. Who are you? Greg hardly recognized his own voice. I'm Lemon Brown, came the answer. Who are you? Greg rightly. What are you doing here? The figure shuffled forward again, and Greg took a small step backward. It's raining, Greg said. I can see that, the figure said. The person who called himself Lemon Brown peered forward, and Greg could see him clearly. He was an old man. His black, heavily wrinkled face was surrounded by a halo of crinkly white hair and whiskers that seemed to separate his head from the layers of dirty coats piled on his smallish frame. His pants were bagged to the knee, where they were met with rags that went down to the old shoes. The rags were held on with strings, and there was a rope around his middle. Greg relaxed. He had seen the man before, picking through trash on the corner and pulling sheets out of a Salvation Army box. There was no sign of a razor that could cut a week into nine days. What are you doing here? Greg asked. This is where I'm standing, Lemon Brown said. What are you here for? Told you it was raining out, Greg said, leaning against the back of the couch until he felt it give light slightly. Ain't you got no home? I got a home, Greg answered. You ain't one of them bad boys looking for my treasure, is you? Lemon Brown cocked his head to one side and squinted one eye. Because I told you I got me a razor. I'm not looking for your treasure, Greg answered, smiling. If you have one. What do you mean, if I have one, Lemon Brown said. Every man got a treasure. You don't know that? You must be a fool. Sure, Greg said as he sat on the sofa and put one leg over the back. What do you have, gold coins? Don't worry none about what I got, Lemon Brown said. You know who I am? You told me your name was Orange or Lemon or something like that. Lemon Brown, the old man said, pulling back his shoulders as he did so. They used to call me Sweet Lemon Brown. Sweet Lemon? Greg asked. Yes, sir. Sweet Lemon Brown. They used to say I sung the blues so sweet that if I sang at a funeral, the dead would commence to rock him with the beat. You should travel all over Mississippi and as far as Monroe, Louisiana, and east on over to Macon, Georgia. You mean you never heard of Sweet Lemon Brown? Afraid not, Greg said. What happened to you? Hard times, boy. Hard times always after a poor man. One day, I got tired, sat down to rest a spell, and felt a tap on my shoulder. Hard times caught up with me. Sorry about that. What are you doing here? How come you don't go home, going home when the rain come? Rain don't bother you young folks none. Just didn't, Greg looked away. I used to have a naughty-headed boy just like you. Lemon Brown had half walked, half shuffled back to the corner and sat down against the wall. Had them big eyes like you. I used to call him Moon Eyes. Look into the Moon Eyes and see anything you want. How come you gave up singing the blues, Greg asked. Didn't give it up, Lemon Brown said. You don't give up the blues. They give you up. After a while, you do good for yourself, and it ain't nothing but foolishness singing about how hard you got it. Ain't that right? I guess so. What's that noise? Lemon Brown asked, suddenly sitting upright. Greg listened, and he heard a noise outside. He looked at Lemon Brown and saw the old man pointing towards the window. Greg went, up, went to the window and saw three men, neighborhood thugs, on the stoop. One was carrying a length pi of pipe. Greg looked back towards Lemon Brown who moved quietly across the room to the window. The old man looked out, then beckoned frantically for Greg to follow him. For a moment, Greg couldn't move. Then he found himself following Lemon Brown into the hallway and up the darkened stairs. Greg followed as closely as he could. They reached the top of the stairs, and Greg felt Lemon Brown's hand, first lying on his shoulder, then probing down his arm until he took Greg's hand into his own as they crouched in the darkness. These bad men, Lemon Brown whispered. His breath was warm against Greg's skin. Hey, ragman, a voice called. We know you in here. What you got under them rags? You got any money? Silence. We don't want to have to come in and hurt you, old man, but don't mind if we have to. Lemon Brown squeezed Greg's hand in his own hard, gnarled fist. There was a banging downstairs and a light as the men entered. They banged around noisily, calling for the ragman. We heard you talking about your treasure, the voice was slurred. We just want to see it, that's all. You sure he's here? One voice seemed to come from the come to the room seemed to come from the room with the sofa. Yeah, he stays here every night. There was another room over there. I'm going to take a look. You got that flashlight? Yeah. Here, take the pipe too. Greg opened his mouth to quiet the sound of his breath as he sucked it in uneasily. A beam of light hit the wall a few feet opposite him, then went out. Ain't nobody in that room, a voice said. You think he gone or something? I don't know, came the answer. All I know is that I heard him talking about some kind of treasure. You know they found that shopping bag lady with a load of money in her bags? Yeah, you think he's upstairs? 
Hey, old man, are you up there? Silence. Watch my back, I'm going up. There was footsteps on the stairs and a beam from the flashlight danced crazily along the peeling wallpaper. Greg held his breath. There was another step and a loud crashing noise as the man banged the pipe against a wooden banister. Greg could feel his te temples throb as the man slowly neared him. Greg thought about the pipe, wondering what he could do when the man reached them. What co he could do. Then Lemon Brown released his hand and moved toward the top of the stairs. Greg looked around and saw stairs going up the next floor. He tried waving to Lemon Brown, hoping the old man would see him in the dim light and follow him to the next floor. Maybe, Greg thought, the man wouldn't follow them up there. Suddenly, though, Lemon Brown stood at the top of the stairs, both arms raised high above his head. There he is, the voice cried from below. Throw down your money, old man, so I don't have to bash your head in. Lemon Brown didn't move. Greg felt himself near panic. The steps came closer, and still Lemon Brown didn't move. He was an eerie sight, a bundle of rags standing at the top of the stairs, a shadow on the wall looming over him. Maybe the thought came to Greg. The scene could be even eerier. Greg wet his lips, put his hand to his mouth, and tried to make a sound. Nothing came out. He swallowed hard wet his lips once more, and howled as evenly as he could. What's that? As Greg howled, the light moved away from Lemon Brown, but not before Greg saw him hurl his body down the stairs at the men who had come to take his treasure. There was a crashing noise, and then footsteps. A rush of warm air came in as the downstairs door opened, and then there was only an ominous silence. Greg stood on the landing. He listened, and after a while, there was another sound on the staircase. Mr. Brown, he called. Yeah, it's me, came the answer. I got their flashlight. Greg exhaled in relief as Lemon Brown made his way slowly back up the stairs. You okay? A few bumps and bruises, Lemon Brown said. I think I'd better be going, Greg said, his breath returning to normal. You'd better leave, too, before they come back. The... The may hang out for a while, Lemon Brown said, but they ain't getting their nerve to up to come up here again. Now with the crazy ragmen and howling spooks, best you stay a while till the coast is clear. I'm heading out west tomorrow, out to St. Louis. They were talking about treasures, Greg said. You really have a treasure? What'd I tell you? Didn't I tell you every man got a treasure, Lemon Brown said? You want to see mine? If you want to show it to me, Greg shrugged. Let's look out the window first. See what them scoundrels be doing, Lemon Brown said. They followed the oval beam of the flashlight into one of the rooms and looked out the window. They saw the men who had tried to take the treasure sitting on the curb near the corner. One of them had his pants leg up, looking at his knee. You sure you're not hurt? Greg asked Lemon Brown. Nothing that ain't been hurt before, Lemon Brown said. When you get as old as me, all you say when something's hurt is howdy, Mr. Payne, sees you back again. Then when Mr. Payne can't see he can't worry you none, he go on mess with somebody else, Greg smiled. Here, you hold this, Lemon Brown gave Greg the flashlight. He sat on the floor near Greg and carefully untied the strings that held the rags on his right knee. When he took the rags away, Greg saw a piece of plastic. The old man carefully took off the plastic and unfolded it. He revealed some yellowed newspaper clippings and a battered harmonica. There it be, he said, nodding his head. There it be. Greg looked at the old man, saw the distant look in his eye, and then turned to the clippings. They told of Sweet Lemon Brown, a blues singer and harmonica player who was appearing at different theaters in the South. One of the clippings said he had been the hit of the show, although not the headliner. All the clippings were reviews of shows Lemon Brown had been in more than 50 years ago. Greg looked at the harmonica. It was dented badly on one side with the red holes on one end nearly closed. I used to travel around and make money to feed my wife and Jesse. That's my boy's name. Used to feed him good, too. Then his mama died, and he stayed with his mama's sister. He grew up to be a man, and when the war come, he saw fit to go off and fight in it. I didn't have nothing to give him except these things that told him who I was, and what he came from. If you know your pappy did something, you know you can do something too.